Grace, mercy, and peace be to you. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples in the Gospel of Luke, the last printed words that he said, that we know that he said, Luke chapter 24, verse 49. He said to them, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you have received the power that is from on high. Then in Luke's companion volume, that verse, by the way, will be the text verse for this message. And then in Luke's companion volume, which is the book of Acts, which is what our, our second lesson, the New Testament lesson, was read from today. Luke picks up on what Jesus had said at the end of the Gospel of Luke, and he shares it again, just reiterating it. So this is what Luke says about Jesus. He says, while he was staying with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to remain in the city until they had received the promise of the Father. For he said, John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. This is Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And then just a few verses later, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus explained why. For you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That power came on Pentecost Day, and it was vividly and prophetically described in our Acts reading for today from Acts chapter 2, which Mike read for us. But there's another power that often prevails in our world today, and even among the likes of people like you and me. It's often called the power of public opinion. This is the power that tailors fashion trends. It's the power that crafts cultural norms. It's the power that lands best-selling literature. It's the power that spawns consumer spending. It's the power that maps out marketing campaigns, that elevates elected officials, that validates prevailing values. The power of public opinion. And it's not narrowed down to just one area of life, but it infiltrates every facet of life in our society, including your life and mine, whether we want it to or not. And this power has been there for a long time. This is the power that about a century ago caused the government and our country to prohibit the production, the sale, or the consumption of alcohol and national constitutional laws in the United States. But it's the same power that, not quite a century later, has caused the government and our state to encourage the production and sale and consumption of other substances like marijuana. It's the same power that sustained the institution of slavery in the United States, and yet it's also the same power that fueled the civil rights movement, and which has led, in our time, to a growing litany of anti-discrimination legislation. This power, the power of public opinion, is neither good nor bad. It's a power that's shifted and changed and it's set by iconic individuals, by the currents of our contemporary <coughs> culture, set by media moguls, and their choices. It's the power of public opinion. And it's this power of public opinion that is telling believers like you and me in our day and age that faith is something very personal and inward. It's a private endeavor. It's something to be held, but not shared. It's to be respected, possibly, but certainly not projected. And so it's this power of public opinion that is encouraging us, even believers like you and me, to remain in hiding. Which in one sense is what Jesus said, remain in the city. Do not depart from here. 
But it's, it's this power of public opinion that Mark Twain, Mark Twain was talking about. And one of his essays that was pulled out and it was published posthumously after he died, it was found. And in that essay, Mark Twain said this about this prevailing sort of public power. He said, we in the United States do no end of feeling and we call it thinking. And from it we gain an aggregation that we consider a boon and its name is public opinion. And it is held in reference, it settles everything, and some think it is the voice of God. Mark Twain, Corn Poem Letters. Ah, uh, this is the voice of God that some hear today that gives the notion that faith should be inward and private. Perhaps respected, never projected. But in Pentecost, in the reading for today from Acts chapter 2, we heard the real voice of God. The real voice of God that was proclaiming and projecting and sharing the amazing work of God and our salvation in languages of people that stretched across the Mediterranean, both north in Europe and south in Africa and all the way across the Middle East. It said in our text for today from Acts chapter 2 that it was being proclaimed and the people, regardless of where they came from, heard it in his or her own native language. Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Now, the disciples didn't need to tell them the mighty works of God in all those languages. Because these are world travelers. I mean, they are here in Rome because they know what it is to travel. I'm sorry, they're here in Jerusalem because they know what it is to travel from different parts of the world. And, and they're, they're used to it. They know the lingua franca. They're able to discuss in the language of commerce. The disciples could have just as easily been speaking to them in Greek, and every one of them would have understood Except there's a phenomenon that happens when you speak to somebody in their own native language. It stirs up things in them that could not be reached. It stirs up areas of their heart that are untouched by the pressure of public opinion. Because when you speak to somebody in their own native language, it, it stirs your heart in a way that no second or third language can. And so an easy illustration of this is in terms of cursing. When somebody curses in, in a language that's a second language or a third language to a person, it's never as offensive as when the person hears the curse words in their own first language. Now, maybe you don't speak any other languages fluently, and neither do I. Perhaps the only language you really speak fluently is English. Instead, you still know this from English because there are others who speak English in other parts of the world, like. British English, and we speak American English, and they have different curse words in British English than we have in American English. And yet when we hear those curse words from British English that aren't our language, well, they just kind of flow in one ear and out the other with, with hardly a pause in our conscience. Why? Well, we kind of know what they mean, and yet it's not our tongues. We're not near as offended by it as when we hear curse words in our own language. And so on the day of Pentecost, when God is to speak, and he's going to share his word. He's going to do it in a language that's going to stir the heart of the people in a place where the pressure of public opinion cannot touch. He's going to stir their hearts in their own native language. And that's what he does. And it says in verse 12 of Acts chapter 2 that it stirred the people to say, amazed and perplexed, what does this mean? In verse 12. And Peter's going to respond to that. Peter's going to answer it. He's going to tell them what it means. And so he goes on to tell them in the words of the prophet Joel, this is nothing other than the voice of God in their midst. The voice of God. And so Peter goes on to say, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, verse 16 and 17. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. Down through verse 18. And, and then Peter continues, even after our text is over. And he goes on to talk to them about something that happened in this city a month 
before, 50 days before. He said, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by mighty works and signs and wonders that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, this Jesus whom you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. That which Peter tells them about Jesus is something that happens because of the pressure of public opinion. See, 50 days ago, the pressure of public opinion led to those events of the crucifixion of Jesus. Although, merely a month or two before that, it was the pressure of public opinion that prevented the Jewish leaders from killing Jesus. And yet there is this week, this pivotal week, where public opinion shifted. We call it Holy Week. And all of a sudden, the Jewish leaders were able to convince the people that crucify him was the voice of God. And so not only did they do it, did they crucify him, but not only the Jewish leaders and the criminal who was next to him on the cross and the soldiers below the cross, but the passers-by too, it says in Scripture, hurled their insults at him. They cursed at him while he was hanging on the cross. And you better believe they did it in his own language so he would get the full force of the offense. But this is what Peter goes on to say about it. In, in this same the same speech that he gave before all the people on Pentecost Day, Peter went on to say in verse 32 and 33, this Jesus God raised up. And of this, we are all witnesses. And being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, which you this day are seeing and hearing. What has been poured out that day is the voice of God through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's what they are seeing and hearing. And it stirs the people up in the places that the court of public opinion cannot touch. And it has them saying not only what does this mean, but also asking of the disciples, what should we do? What should we do? And Peter tells them what to do. Verse 38 and 39 of chapter 2, Peter says, Repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you too will receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. See, on Pentecost, I think we as believers in Jesus tend to center in on the gift of the speaking in tongues as the gift of the Holy Spirit that was given at Pentecost. And yet there's something much more charismatic going on at Pentecost that actually continues in the life of the disciples from that point on. They don't continue to speak in tongues throughout the book of Acts, but there's something else that does continue because the Spirit's gift has been given to them. And what is it that continues? In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, whether they're gathered together with just a group of other believers, or Acts chapter 4, verse 8, whether they're standing trial before the Sanhedrin. The gift that continues in the disciples is this unnatural, inhuman boldness to celebrate the mighty works of God's salvation in the presence of other peoples without inhibition. Not that they weren't being inhibited. They were. When they stood before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, the whole council stood against them. The whole court of public opinion was against them and charged them never to speak in the name of Jesus of this salvation again. And yet, Peter said to them in that text, you must be the judge of whether it's right to listen to you or to listen to God. But we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift of this unnatural and inhuman Ability and willingness to recognize the Word of God and to share it. And that's what the apostles did, not only that day at Pentecost, but continued to do from there after. Because this is what Jesus said in our Gospel lesson. John chapter 6, 15, verse 26, the very first verse of our Gospel lesson. Jesus said about the Spirit, He will bear witness about me. That's what the Spirit does. And He fills us with that ability to bear witness. Now, court of public opinion in our day says there are things you should not talk about in polite society. Uh, around other people, you should never talk about remember what these are? Politics and religion. You should not talk about politics and religion. And, and maybe that's actually good advice. But what the Spirit is 
prompting us to do is not to talk about politics and religion. It's not about moralities. It's not about value systems, which is what people think of when they think of politics and religion. But the Spirit prompts us to share boldly in the presence of others and without inhibition is affirming the work of God in Jesus and the voice of God to extend that salvation invitation to others. That's what the people at Pentecost heard from the disciples who were proclaiming the mighty works of God in all of their languages. They heard an invitation to be a part of this salvation. That's why they said to the disciples, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, be baptized, because this is for you too. The forgiveness of sins and the same gift of the Spirit is also for you. It's the opportunity to extend that salvation invitation. And the Spirit of God gives us the uncanny ability and willingness to recognize that Word of God and share it. And that's been true for believers down through the ages, from the apostles to those after them who had believed in that message and so were baptized and so received the Holy Spirit and continued to proclaim it all the way down to our day and age today. In fact, we had some uh, students do this for you last week. Uh, we had uh, Ty Howard who stood before you in this service and we had five others in the other services as the confirmation stood up and shared their faith and the power of the Holy Spirit in their own words, but it was the voice of God sharing the faith that the Holy Spirit had given to them and proclaiming the work of Jesus in their life and extending that invitation to us too. And that invitation actually comes to us every time we gather in this place. The invitation not only to receive the Word of God and believe it, but also to receive again His forgiveness and be filled again with His Holy Spirit. And this is why David prays in Psalm 51. Renew a right spirit within me. When he prays for forgiveness, he not only prays for forgiveness, but he prays that the Lord would renew that gift of the Spirit in him. It's not just a once and done at our baptism, but, but God continues to fill us with that Spirit to give us that unnatural and human ability in the face of the intimidation, even when public opinion is against us, and to continue to extend that salvation invitation to others to join us. And, and that's happened down through the centuries. And so about 60 years ago, there was a young priest in Poland. A young priest and pastor who was living in Poland during the height of communism's power. And public opinion at the time was pinning all of its hopes on a new socialism. And, and so there, in the outskirts of Krakow, there was, in this young priest's lifetime, a new city that was being built. It was called Nowa Huta, which in Polish, I'm told, means the new steel mill. And it was an industrialized city, and it was supposed to be an ideal utopian city, the, the pinnacle of the socialist lifestyle engineering. And so it was engineered to be a place that was without, intentionally without faith centers, without spiritual centers, without churches. Because they were removing that crutch that weak-minded individuals used to lean on. And instead, the only faith there would be faith in the wonders of modern mankind. And so that was this new city that was being built on the outskirts of Krakow. And about the same time that that was being completed, this young priest and pastor named Carol, that was his given first name, was made bishop in Krakow. The youngest bishop ever in Poland. And the first thing he did when he was made bishop of Krakow, contrary to all popular opinion at the time, he did what was thought unthinkable. And he held an open air worship service on Christmas Eve in the midst of Noah Huta for anybody who would come. And not only that, he started a campaign of erecting crosses across that faithless city. And within a year after that happened, people of Noah Huta, the, the believers, or believers who worked there or lived there, who had been in hiding ever since that place was built, began to petition the government for the ability to build a church in the city. And seven years later, the power of public opinion shifted by the work of the Holy Spirit. 
as government officials in communist Poland actually approved the building of a church, approved permits for the building of a place called Arkapana in Noah Huda, which translated in English means the Lord's Ark. It was the first church built in that faithless city outside of Krakow in Poland. So it's no wonder that that young priest later on went on to ascend to the highest post in all of his church body. And you now it seems kind of odd to us that uh, your pastor would be telling you a story about a Roman Catholic Pope on the day of Lutheran Confirmation. But you know what? It doesn't matter whether Pope or Confirmation student. It's the same spirit. When the same spirit is speaking through us and presenting that invitation to salvation in Christ Jesus, it is the spirit doing the work, no matter what your rank or status in the church or, or place among God's people. Because that is the power that prevails over the power of this world. It's the one power that prevails even over the power of public opinion. It's the power from on high. And when that power is at work in you and me, like it was in our confirmation students last week sharing their faith essays, and that power is at work in them today as next service they stand up here in unison, profess their faith in Jesus and who he is, and we pray that that power would continue to speak through them for the rest of their lives, that this would just be a start. And I pray that that witness of theirs to you and me would encourage us to do the same. Because our calling isn't the same necessarily. It doesn't mean we have to do this in, in open air venues of mass worship services. That's not the calling, that's the calling of an apostle or a bishop. But our calling is to do it among neighbors and friends, among family members and co workers, among kids and grandkids. Our calling is to continue to speak the marvelous works of God for our salvation through the gift of the Spirit in a way uninhibited by the power of public opinion. And we can do that because there is a power in this world that's stronger than the power of public opinion. It is the power from on high. And Pentecost is here, and that power has come. No more hiding. In Jesus' name, amen.